New Orleans, Louisiana. The Big Easy. Today, the city's historic French Quarter is thriving. But in 2005, it was devastated by Hurricane Katrina. 80% of the city was underwater. It was one of the biggest natural disasters in American history. Violent hurricanes happen every few years in this part of the world. So when it comes to protecting New Orleans from the next massive storm, how do they do it? Defending New Orleans from a hurricane takes meticulous planning. The men and women of the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers have over 500 kilometers of coastline to protect. There really isn't a section that would not require an additional environmental. No, no, there is no real estate action. The city is surrounded by canals, rivers, and lakes, but the biggest threat comes from the sea. A hurricane can drive a wall of water before it. To the east of the city, the sea walls converge, forming a giant funnel. During Katrina, this funnel directed the storm surge into the heart of New Orleans. So this is where they're building their first line of defense, the biggest surge barrier in the world. The barrier is being constructed around a series of huge reinforced hollow concrete piles that are driven almost 40 meters into the lake bed. Thinner piles are then sunk to fill in the gaps. This concrete wall is then to be buttressed by a series of enormous steel pipes, each one 75 meters long. These towering steel rods will be planted in the lake bed at a 45 degree angle behind the barrier. Next, the piles are filled with more concrete and steel reinforcing bars. And then a cap and parapet wall is added to hold the supports in place and raise the height of the barrier to eight meters above sea level. In all, over 4,400 gigantic piles will have to be sunk to complete this mammoth structure. Work began in May 2009. To drive the main piles into place, requires a special piece of equipment. It looks like a hammer. It sounds like a hammer. But it's not. It's a massive piston. And it pushes the piles into the ground in the same way a diesel engine pushes a truck along. When the piston comes down, it compresses a mixture of fuel and air in the chamber above the concrete pile. When the pressure reaches a certain point, the fuel explodes, pushing down the pile and the piston rises, releasing the exhaust gases. With each push, the pile is driven another 30 millimeters into the lake bed. In five and a half months, 1,271 piles are hammered into place. The next challenge, to plant the huge supporting metal spikes, known as batter piles, which go behind the barrier. The spikes are ferried to the barrier on barges. The problem is, each of these steel poles is over 60 meters long, almost a meter across, and weighs 90 tons. One at a time, the steel pipes are lifted carefully onto a long frame. The frame is attached to the concrete barrier below at an angle of 45 degrees. Once the spike is safely on the frame, it's slowly lowered into the water. When it reaches the lake bed, a massive hydraulically driven 16-ton hammer gets to work. This really is a hammer, slamming down with a force of 120,000 joules. That's 800 times the force of a karate punch. The entire barrier shakes as it forces the giant pile into the ground. But there's a problem. The piles must be driven to a depth of 60 meters. And the cranes cannot lift more than 100 tons of steel at a time. The answer is to carefully swing another huge length of pipe into the hammer frame and weld the two pieces together. With the two sections joined, the final few meters of hammering can begin. Once one steel pipe is in, 
the frame above then has to be unbolted and moved along the barrier, ready for the next one. With the steel piles in place, it's time for the reinforced concrete cap, which will hold everything together. It comes in chunks, 96 tons at a time. Slowly, carefully, each section is lifted into position. The men push and pull the huge concrete cap before it's gently lowered into place. And with the heavy lifting done, the protruding steelwork is tied and enclosed with more concrete. Ready mixed and delivered from a waiting barge. When it's complete, this extraordinary fortification will present a formidable eight meter high barrier to the advancing sea. But this is only the first line of the city's defenses. It's a worrying thought that around half of New Orleans sits below sea level. The canals are higher than much of the city. And the Big Easy has more canals than Venice. They're used for drainage transporting rainwater away from the city into the sea. But when Katrina struck, the sea rushed in, undermining these canal walls. Some collapsed with disastrous results. So we're gonna start, where are we gonna start? Sir, uh, right around. Uh, so the call has to find a way to keep the sea out whilst allowing water to drain away. Uh, well, if we could go down to Vulcan, uh, hit on the uh, IHNC-02. The solution is to build a floodgate flanked by gigantic pipes. When the gate shuts, the pumps are turned on and the canal drains through these pipes. Work on the floodgate began in January 2006 and just five months later, the floodgate and pump station were operational. Every two weeks, the pumps are put through their paces to make sure they're ready for the next big one. Three pumps go into one header, and we're looking for a discharge reading on this meter. Together, the pumps shift an awesome 60 million liters of water a minute, enough to fill 2,000 baths a second. Oh, I'm going to see the CFS is starting to pump now. The next problem is that flood defenses like these need people on the ground to keep them operational. When the next big hurricane hits, Heath Jones and the team at the Army Corps Emergency Operations Center will be literally in the eye of the storm. This is the command and control center for the New Orleans district during a hurricane event. And basically this is where all the action happens. This is our supervisor control and data acquisition system. We have gate closures out of the three canals, out of the three outfall canals. Um, we'll use this to be able to control pumps, to control gates, to monitor water levels, and basically everything that's going on at these closure structures, we can monitor from this office. But what if a storm is so devastating that it destroys the emergency operations center? The guys will beat a hasty retreat down here to the bunker. This backup command and control center sits in a solid steel box. This is our emergency bunker. What we have here is our generator that gives us electrical backup power for if the city power goes down. Never mind a hurricane, in here they could survive a medium-sized nuclear bomb. The building is actually four-inch thick steel. It's designed to withstand against the F5 tornado wind speed. It's bolted to the floor, so this, this building's going nowhere, even if the whole warehouse blows away. This is our main op center right here. This is kind of a duplication of what we saw up front in the, in the building, all the same capabilities. These are bunks. Uh, this is a place where we get a little shut-eye during, during an event. Uh, these were actually used during Katrina and, and Gustav. The whole bunker was used during those two events. So uh, it comes in really handy to be able to, to get a little bit of rest during an event. Back there we have laundry, shower, bathroom. Inside here, Heath and the team will be ready to protect New Orleans with $14 billion of pumps, floodgates and barriers at their command.